Mindfulness is not a concept, it's a practice. You have to actually exercise a certain kind of muscle. Our repeated experiences shape our brain. You can't be in the moment if you can't concentrate. The ability to be present stems from being able to be concentrated. Want to be happy? Build a life, not just a business. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and this channel was created to help you overcome the number one challenge that is holding you back, a lack of belief in yourself. You watch these videos because you know there's something more inside you too. You've got Michael Jordan level genius at something. So today, let's live your best belief life and learn how to develop some mindfulness habits. Enjoy. Okay, let's kick it off with habit number one, rest in awareness with John Kabat-Zinn. Is mindfulness science? Is it art? Is it spiritual? It's, it's a gateway into the full dimensionality of being human oh, and being alive. I love that. It's a gateway into the full dimensionality of being human. And without it, you're just missing out. Well, you're missing a lot. Uh, you know, if, if you miss the look in your child's eye one day, you've missed it. Uh, if you've missed the look in your lover's eyes the next day, you've missed that. If you miss the beauty of sitting under trees, well, you've missed that. If you sum that over uh, many moments, many years, you may wind up missing the most beautiful aspects of your own life. Mm -hmm. Who are you gonna blame for that? Well, I was too busy. Well, who, who, who is too busy? Who tells oneself, I don't have any time? When all you've got is time, all you've got is this moment. Waking up, of course, is what it's all about. I mean, it's about being awake, right? Yeah. Uh, but there's waking up and then there's waking up. So you can wake up and like drag yourself around. So brushing your teeth meditation, being uh -huh. in the bathroom, it's all like part of it. But then I go downstairs, I get on my yoga mat, and I have a routine that I've developed over the past 50 years that's just like what I like to do. And I do that mindfully. So it's mindful yoga. And then out of that, at when the time is right, maybe it's an hour, maybe it's 40 minutes or whatever it is, then I, I drop into sitting. And I usually sit cross-legged on the floor, but you can sit in a chair. And I, I just kind of drop into the body. Hmm. Body is like a really important part of this. Can we live inside the body? Because most of the time we don't. And then can we rest in awareness? Just rest, underline rest, in wakefulness, in awareness, in mindfulness, in heartfulness. And that's the practice. Now, there are a lot of different ways to do it. There are a lot of different details. But the most important thing, I think, for your viewers is drop in. Drop in on yourself and rest for a stretch of time. And then as you go about your daily life, mindfulness in everyday life. Check in. It's just like that. Once an hour, once, once a minute. Check in. Once a day. It's like you decide, but at a certain point, it's going to wind up teaching you. You know, we like to say... I'm, I meditate. You know, he's in the like, I'm breathing, I'm yeah. meditating. Uh, or you'll say, I'm doing the practice. That's the way meditators talk. They say, I'm doing my practice. After a while, it doesn't feel that way anymore. It feels more like the practice is doing me. I am learning so much. It's like the world is teaching me everything I need to know. If I only get quiet and drop in and attend. Mindfulness is all about being. And the cliche goes, we're called human beings, but we actually have lost touch with that element of life. That's what we were doing sitting around fires as hunters and gatherers, mm -hmm, we were mm -hmm. being. But now it's gotten so much more complex. What mindfulness is saying is find your own way. Listen to your own heart. Listen to your own, you use the word longing. Longing. Listen to your own yearning. Because what we're really trying to do is live our life as if it really mattered. Because it does. And it does. And I like to say, more than you think, and then yeah. more than you can think. I like to say to people, okay, here's a little homework for you after we've talked about mindfulness. And, and it's, it's very important to keep in mind that mindfulness is not a concept, it's a practice. You have to actually exercise a certain kind of muscle. So I say, here's a little mindfulness homework for you. The next time you're in the shower, check and see if you're in the shower. 
because you may not be in the shower. You, or you may have your whole Monday morning, nine o'clock meeting in the shower with you. <laughs> but you are not actually there under the water, feeling the water on your skin. You're off in the future or off in the past. So that's exercising the muscle. The more you do that, the more you realize, when I'm in the shower, I'm in the shower. When I'm brushing my teeth, I'm brushing my teeth. When I'm saying goodbye to my family, I'm saying goodbye to my family. It only takes a fraction of a second longer to do it with awareness. Okay, so everybody who's watching this right now, Mm -hmm. the next time you get in the shower, you're going to think, am I in the shower? Are you in the meeting? Are you already on the freeway? Check. And as soon as you check, you're back. And you, you you have something you can do about it. If you are obsessed with some kind of thing, worried about how things are going to go that day or whatever. Mm -hmm. That's all fine. Your awareness is big enough to hold it all. It's not like now you have to suppress all that thinking or the meeting in the shower. The knowing it is good enough. That knowing is what we call awareness. And then it's laughable, so you'll feel better. When we get quiet, when we get still, when we rest, you could say, in awareness our natural impulse to see connections that we didn't see the moment before uh, is unimpeded. And we can actually make these connections and realize them in ways that we might not have been able to do the moment before. The easiest thing for people to think uh, about mindfulness is that it equals awareness. You and I sitting here having a conversation, you know, the thought might cross one of our minds, well, when are we going to get down to meditating? The fact is, we are. Mindfulness is, is a particular way of being in relationship to your life. And the place to start, of course, is the fact that we're only alive in this moment. The future hasn't happened yet. The past is memory and is over. But... If you start to pay attention to where your mind is, most of the time it's not in the present moment, it's off someplace else, obsessing about the past or planning or worrying about the future. So what mindfulness is, is a particular way of paying attention and the awareness that arises from paying attention in that way. Habit number two, allow time to decompress with Giselle Bundchen. You can make decisions from a place of really, instead of like, you know, rush decisions and like I have to make this decision and you, you're not very clear about it. When you can take a step back and become the observer, you make decisions f- f- with a different level of awareness, with a different clarity and therefore better decisions. And I think in the very beginning when I was going through my severe anxiety and panic attacks, um, I actually went into like, you know, I don't know if you guys ever heard about Vipassana, which is like a 10 day, like intense meditation. Um, I actually do like seven days and go in silence and just meditate for seven days. And with that, a lot of stuff comes up. Obviously, when you're not talking, you realize how much the monkey mind is trying to take control because that's the job of the mind, right? It's to kind of, he's like a friend told me this once. He says, Giselle, the mind is an instrument. Don't let it play you. So it's, it's a really powerful thing to remember, to be, just, just remember that, you know, that, that is, that's the job of the mind is to hold on to things and to, to kind of attach to things. And it's your job to say, I choose this thought and I don't choose that. And I, you know, because whatever you give energy to is what grows. I actually have a chapter in my book that it talks about that. It's like, you know, where your energy goes is what grows. And it's like, we have to choose where we put our energy in because that's where we're going to manifest. So it's, it's the, the more consciously and we can make those choices and where we're t- letting our mind go, the better it's gonna be for us. Do you find your meditation practice also makes you more kind of outward focused on the world? I think it just gives you a different kind of awareness. I think you see things from a different place. I think everything slows down and you become more conscious of, I think, of everything. Because when you meditate, what you do is like you become, you become silent. And I think there's, a, in, especially in our society today, everything has happened so fast. I mean, I remember when I was a kid, you know, there was no cell phones. Like, even when I moved to Japan, I had to use my, the calling cards to call my mom and be like, you know, you got one dollar left. And I, you know, I called my mom like once a month from Japan because there was no, you know, 1994. You know, 1995. And, and I think, you know, someone calls the house and you're like, wait a minute, I'll get the message from my mom. You know, I remember when the phones came out and they had actually the message that you can leave a message. Before uh-huh. that, you couldn't. So you had like a notepad and a pencil next to the phone to leave the message. And I think it was in a way so great because, you know, 
people who could do their job and then could go home and they would have conversations at the dinner table with their family and they would, if people couldn't catch them at work, they would have to wait to the next day. And now I think with this kind of speed up process where you're available 24 seven, I think it's, it's, it's really creating a lot more anxiety. So I think even more so it's important to have the moments, if, like you said, you know, a few times a day. I don't think you need to go for like seven, you know, a Vipassana or like five days. Maybe sometimes you do if you have a specific thing you're dealing with, but if it would be good if every day you can check in, you know, if it's two minutes in a car ride, if it's five minutes in the morning when you wake up, if it's before you go to bed, if it's before an important meeting, just to take a moment, you know, go, go, into, go, in, go inward, take, you know, focus on your breath, deep breathing, and just allow yourself to, you know, to kind of decompress. I think it's essential to be able to deal with the amount of pressure we have in our society today. I mean, I don't know how else, I mean, I couldn't do it without it. When I see myself getting like, kind of like, ants in my pants and I feel like a little bit like agitated and I can't really, I'm like, you know, this is a good moment for me to take a, you know, five minutes and just go in word and I come out of it. Just, I don't know if it's because I, I, I allow myself to breathe deeply and I, and I can really feel myself getting back into my body because I think a lot of times when the anxiety and all those things comes, like if you notice you're not breathing, you're outside of your body, everything becomes very hectic and then if you can just center yourself, just take that moment, is a gift that, that costs nothing, you know? is a gift, is the biggest gift I think, you know, that you can just, all it takes is the awareness to say, you know, this is the, mo this is, I'm gonna take this five minutes or two minutes or however long I have right now to just sit, sit in silence and, and breathe. Habit number three, take a step back with Jay Shetty. I usually like to compare mindfulness to a remote control. Imagine you could press pause on a thought. Imagine you could use that time to just reflect, take a step back, observe. Imagine you could fast forward to something in the past, learn from it straight away, and then press play again when you felt comfortable. Does that sound like a good idea? Would that feel good? Mindfulness really allows you to find that clarity, space, time, so that you can actually navigate your mind and not just be led by it to wherever it may, may flow. We spend so much of our life lost in the maze and lost in the details that we often don't be able to get that bird's eye view. So we've just shown how actually one of the biggest things, the greatest things about mindfulness is just that slight three steps backwards so that we can look at our challenges, look at our situations when we need to with a bit more space. One of the second things I hear often is that mindfulness is for those who are stressed or meditation is for those who are struggling with mental health. The incredible thing is Harvard, Stanford, you name it, they've done incredible scientific studies around how mindfulness actually helps people become more focused, become more creative, and be able to apply their attention anywhere and everywhere they like. And one of my favorite things about that is I often say that Silicon Valley has done more for mindfulness than the monks have. Because Silicon Valley have been such great proponents of mindfulness and their practice of it with their employees who have to be creative, who have to be inventing the next steps. That mindfulness actually allows us to do that. Hey everyone, I have been reading a bit from my friend's book, Evan Carmichael, Built to Serve, and I wanted to share this with you. So according to a study by Carnegie Mellon University, People with supportive spouses are more likely to give themselves the chance to succeed. They studied 163 married couples and found that people with supportive spouses were more likely to take on potentially rewarding challenges. Those who accepted challenges experienced more personal growth, happiness, and psychological well-being. Now, I can truly say that I've experienced that in my life. When I first met my wife, I was just starting out. I had never released a video. I hadn't created any content. And she was such an important part of feeling supported on that journey. So whether you're in a relationship, whether you're dating, whether you're married, or even if you're single, being supported by friends and a strong community is important. Uh, Built to Serve by Ellen Carmichael, great book on how you can find your purpose and also on reminding us that we can all make a difference in the world. Thanks, Evan. Habit number four, reflect with Dr. Hansaji Yogendra. When you enter the Yoga Institute, that small little gate we have written there, please close the door. Mindfulness is yoga. Yeah. Whatever you are doing, see that your mind is present there and you do. Uh, you see, human mind is very intelligent mind, highly developed mind. 
So that mind is going anywhere and everywhere. It doesn't stay at one place. That's the whole problem with us. Because we are highly developed. An animal mind is simple. When an animal is hungry, the animal goes in search for food. And mind doesn't go anywhere else because it's hungry. So the need is there. Otherwise, he will not survive. The mind is focused on that. Totally yeah. focused. Concentration is perfect in animals. Natural. But human, human needs are so many. And their needs are so many. And not that need like animal birth or death type. If you can't eat food, for you will be struggling. Nothing like that in human life. And so, mind goes anywhere and everywhere. Usually what happens is when we suffer thoroughly, thoroughly well in life, then we think of changing. Till then we have that laziness in us. Dullness is us. Chalta hai. Let it be. Kya difference does it make? That type of a personality, yoga would never accept. Yoga would see to it that if you are doing, you do it very well. Under pain and suffering, there is some little resolution in mind that now you will not do this, you will do this. Sometimes person is talking, talking and, and talks something which is not so good. And then she realizes or he realizes that I should not have spoken this. Well, so now you become mindful. Is it required to speak? Then only open your mouth, otherwise don't open. This little thinking has to go deeper into us. So this way we become little alert and aware. Mindfulness means awareness. So first of all form a habit that whatever you are doing, you see to it that you, your mind is there with you when you are doing anything. Let it be brushing your teeth or eating your food or talking to each other or doing anything or even resting, sleeping. Your mind should be there with you. While sleeping. Completely present to the moment. Yes. So you have come to the point that you learn to be in present moment. And that will help you uh, to do your job well. So unless you are mindful, you will not be able to do any work well in life. This habit, where your body is, your mind should be. Where your mind is, your emotion should be. Where your emotions are, your faith should be. Faith means confidence, mm. willpower, that should be. Then you do your work. So either you are doing work mechanically without mind or mind is there but emotions are not there. You do it very in a dry way like machine. Now everything should be present, body, mind, emotion and faith. All these four things together and you are working. That is mindfulness. So we should form such habit. Let's do few things, but do it systematically very well. So we have one technique in yoga. We always say that at night before going to bed, just reflect. How did you spend your day? You should know how did you spend your day and what did you do? So right from till now, earlier, one hour before, what did you do? Still before, what did you do? Till your morning when you got up. And then you realize there are certain things which you don't even remember. I know one boy, he came to me, he had definitely, he was wearing something else. In the morning he was wearing something else. But he was telling me, Ansaji, I don't know whether I have taken bath or not. Mind is not there <laughs> only. While taking bath, while eating food, while going here and there. That has, that is the biggest problem now. Now the mind has become so mechanical with all these machines and gadgets in our hand. That little toy which we have always, the computer and the phone, mobile phone, that we are not using our mind. Everything is used by the machine. Autopilot mode. That autopilot mode. That is very wrong when it comes to self-development. See to it that you are not so much dependent on anything, but dependent on yourself. So be very, very clear. When mind is with you, you will never go to past. You will rather remain in present. From past you learn. History is for learning. You, the history of anything, you just learn from that. Learning. Don't remain in past. Remaining in past means you are, your progress is going down. As far as future is concerned, don't think about it. Past will always bring tears in your eyes. And future will always bring fear in your eyes. <laughs> what will happen? What will fear happen? No. <laughs> remain in present. That will bring 
cheer Aha. in your okay. life. <laughs> there are four things which you are supposed to do in a day. Mm. One is doing your duty. All your responsibilities and duties you must do. Mm. Second is earning money. Mm. That is your duty. Third is rest, recreation, hobbies. Mm. Equally important that you should do. And fourth is some selfless work. Something for others. And so these are four types of work. So where your spiritual growth will occur. Mm. So these four types of things you should do. So become mindful. Have I done all these four things? No. Then plan your day next day better and do it better. So try and live life like that and it would be beautiful. How about number five? Evolve with Sadhguru. In a day, from the moment I leave the sleep time for you, that also needs to be considered. But we will leave that. From the moment you come awake till the moment you fall asleep, how many moments and how many actions and how many thoughts and how many emotions or how much percentage of it do you conduct consciously? This will determine the state of your evolution right now. If you conduct it consciously, you will do it in a certain way. If you're going about compulsively, you will look like any other creature. Yes? You will look like just any other creature, not any different. Once you do things compulsively, only when you conduct it consciously, you seem to be on the peak of evolution on this planet, not otherwise. So you can gauge by yourself, I don't want to pass… I don't want to pass a judgment on anybody. <laughs> From the moment you come awake till the time you go asleep, fall asleep, how much percentage of time are you conducting your body, your mind, your emotion, your energy and your actions consciously? If you are less than one percent, you know there's a lot of work to do. And I would tell you, the, if I have to speak frankly, more than ninety percent is less than one percent. Less than, well below one percent, more than ninety percent of the people. Those ten percent who do little more than one percent, suddenly they look like such graceful beings. Just from tomorrow morning, you want to do it from tomorrow morning or now? From this moment till you fall asleep, just see how much of you can you conduct consciously, all aspects of you, your body, your actions, your mind, your thoughts, your emotions, your energies, everything. To what extent can you conduct it consciously? You see, if you conduct this consciously for five minutes, if by tomorrow morning people will bow down to you without knowing why they're doing. So that's evolution. And it's something you can do. If you just see it's me, not something else, you'll evolve. Because once you become human, you have enough awareness and consciousness to evolve consciously. When you were a monkey, you did not decide I'll become human being. Nature just pushed you on. But now you're conscious enough to decide I want to evolve from where I am to whatever is possible. Just… just try. Just maintain five minutes, manage your life consciously today. You will see tomorrow morning how you will be. You will be shining, believe me. Habit number six, cultivate a loving attitude with Dr. Ron Siegel. Mindfulness is a translation of a Pali term, and Pali was the vernacular language in which the teachings of the historical Buddha were first written down. And the word in Pali is sati, and it connotes awareness, attention, and remembering. And the awareness and attention part are pretty much the way we use them in English, to be aware and to pay attention. But the remembering is different. It's not about remembering what you had for breakfast, or for that matter, even remembering childhood trauma. It's about remembering to be aware and pay attention at each moment of our day. Now there's a, um, a scholar of the ancient text named uh, John Dunn at Emory University, and he raised the following criticism. He said, you know, if you could imagine a sniper poised on top of a building getting ready to take out an innocent victim, that sniper would be very aware very attentive, and every time his mind wandered from the task at hand, he'd be zeroing right in on it. And John said, I don't think that's exactly the attitude you're trying to develop in yourselves as psychotherapists, nor the attitude you're trying to cultivate in your patients or clients. Something's missing here. 
And what's missing is a sense of non-judgment, acceptance, kindness, and friendliness. Now, there are some scholars who say that's included in, in sati, but the important point is that this non-judgment or acceptance is a skill unto itself and which takes some work to cultivate. Let me show you what I mean. Join me in looking at this fellow and just take in the picture of him and see what emotion arises as you look at him. And raise your hand if what you feel is a sense of harsh and critical judgment. <laughs> we can talk afterwards if so. But you know, most of us look at him and feel something like, oh, right? Okay. Now, even if he pees and poops at the wrong time in the wrong place, even if he doesn't listen to instructions, we can understand he's young, he's a puppy, he needs training, right? Now, when you take up mindfulness practices, most of us, one of the first things we see is that our mind does actually pee and poop at the wrong time in the wrong place, and it doesn't listen to instructions at all. That is quite, quite unruly. And the same kind of loving attitude that we would cultivate toward that puppy, that's what we're gonna try to cultivate toward whatever arises in our consciousness, including depressive feelings, anxious feelings, physical pain, and the like. There's a well-known Zen teaching story about a horrible sadistic general who had come to town, this was in medieval Japan, and they were uh, burning crops and burning buildings and killing the able-bodied boys and men, and they were raping women. It was horrible. And this general really wanted to vanquish the townsfolks, and he caught wind that they respected their Zen master. So he took his horse and he rode up the hillside into the main hall of the Zen temple. And there sitting on the meditation cushion is this little old man, the Zen master. And the general takes his bloody sword and he holds it over the Zen master. He says, don't you realize I can run you through with the sword without blinking an eye? And the little old man looks up and he says, yes, and I, sir, can be run through with a sword without blinking an eye. And it's said that at that moment, the general becomes disoriented and leaves town. Now, it's not always gonna work as a military intervention, but it speaks to how these practices develop our capacity to be with discomfort and not to have to escape it. Once we've practiced mindfulness for a while and spent time dropping out of the thought stream and staying at the sensory level, let's say the anger comes up and all I experience is the body tensing up, heart rate increasing, respiration increasing, blood pressure, well, you don't feel blood pressure, but um, body temperature increasing, and perhaps the thought Right, coming and passing like a cloud in the sky. Perhaps the image of decapitating my former friend dancing through the mind's eye. But it's all seen as a kind of impersonal process of mental contents arising and passing. And when we can experience it that way, we get much less caught in it and it is much easier to let it come and go. Habit number seven, feel passionate with Brendan Burchard. Detachment from any feeling, emotion, or even sometimes expectation to the day. It's not feeling anything and allowing yourself to feel things, even when they're good. You know, a lot of people have done so much work in their life to blot out negative emotion that they're not letting in positive emotion. Or so many people feel like they've been failing so much in their lives, they don't have a connection to the things when they do succeed. So they're not integrating success, right? They might have a good thing, a good series of things happens to them, but they don't feel them. They don't allow themselves to take that success in, that, that win in it, and really internalize it and say, wow, you know, I, I did that. And since that moment of satisfaction or pride to doing something amazing, they never allow themselves any of the positive emotions of life, and they don't allow those positive emotions to stick, to settle in. That's why one of the first things that a psychologist will do in working with a new patient is make sure at the end of the day, they start journaling positive things that happen throughout their day. It's been scientifically proven that you can essentially just start a gratitude journal and lift up your level of happiness in life. Why? Because now you're paying attention for the things that do bring you positive emotion and happiness in life. You're recording them, you're writing them down. It's physicalizing that memory and feeling it and sensing it and allowing it to come in. So try that. You know, if you feel like you've been detached from emotion in life, it's time to allow that back in, to allow yourself to feel passionate and excited about things again, to allow yourself to get dorked out about a new learning opportunity, a new thing you're gonna see, to allow yourself to say, you know what, I did that, good for me, to have some sense of pride about some things, you know? You deserve that, you did some good things. And it's also allowing yourself not to be detached from negative things. You know, so many people are so scared to, to experience a negative thing that, it's like they've never developed any strength or capability of dealing with those things, 
right? Do you know anybody who can't handle conflict? They're always running from conflict because they've always detached from that emotion. Oh, I'm scared, I'm scared. Part of the way that we become mature and enlightened adults is we start to face the things that we are fearful of or we are scared of and we allow ourselves to feel it and to sense it. It's okay to feel the fear. It's okay to feel uncomfortable about something. It's okay to feel vulnerable. It's okay to feel what other people might call negative or scary or uncertain emotions. Because the more comfort that you start to have with uncomfortable emotions, the more comfort you have with uncomfortable situations, the more you start to develop more consciousness about how to deal with them, right? And the only way you're ever gonna develop comfort with them is allowing yourself to accept that and to acknowledge, wow, this is the feeling I'm having right now about this. Why am I feeling this way? Is this how I want to feel? Will this add or contribute here? Is there anything I can do to shift or generate a new emotion that would be more positive or healthy for me? That's consciousness. So you have to be, you don't have to, you can't do that if you're detached from every emotion or every opportunity and every experience that comes into your life. You have to feel again. Habit number eight, be happy with Richard Davidson. This is a quote from William James. He said, the faculty of voluntarily bringing back a wandering attention over and over again is the very root of judgment, character, and will. An education which should improve this faculty would be the education par excellence. And then he went on to say, but it is easier to define this ideal than to give practical directions for bringing it about. I think if William James had more intimate familiarity with the contemplative traditions, he would have instantaneously seen that these were methods that can be used to educate attention. A recent study published in a major scientific journal used smartphones to sample people's experience in the world, and they asked people several questions. They asked them, what are you doing right now? And I had to check off on a list of activities. And the second question is, where is your mind right now? Is it focused on what you're doing or is it focused elsewhere? And the third question that they asked them is how happy are you or unhappy are you right at this moment? And what was found in this study, this was a sample of thousands of people, what was found is that the average American adult spends 47% of her or his waking life not paying attention to what they're doing. Folks, we could do better. Even if it's just a smidgen better, we could do better. And when they were not paying attention to what they're doing, they reported that they were unhappy. So let me end with just telling a little story. I was in Dharamsala with His Holiness the Dalai Lama on one occasion, and during a tea break, I was with him with just one other person, so just the three of us, and there was this, the person who was with me was this really crazy Japanese scientist. Um, and the Japanese scientist leans over and he said to His Holiness, Your Holiness, can you please tell us the time in your life when you were the most happy? And I thought, that was re that's a really interesting question. And just like that, His Holiness said, right now. Habit number nine, create new habits with Shauna Shapiro. Our repeated experiences shape our brain. Does this remind you of anything? Right? It's exactly what this monk told me. What we practice becomes stronger. Everything that we practice, every single moment matters. So these are brains from Harvard. I think that makes them a little more special. <laughs> um, and basically, Sarah Lazar did this wonderful early research, and what she found is that meditators, the actual parts of their brain that have to do with attention, concentration, emotional intelligence, compassion, those parts of the brain actually get stronger, bigger. It's, what, it's called cortical thickening. And that this thickening is correlated with practice. What we practice gets stronger. So the way I like to think of it is we have these super highways of habits. And they're just like, they're well-grooved pathways in our brain, right? They just, you know, they're what we automatically do. And what mindfulness is helping us start to do is to kind of like 
build kind of like, I, I think of it as like digging a country road. You're, you're, you're clearing all the brambles in your brain. You're creating this new neural pathway that's like, oh, I'm going to actually do it with compassion this time or with a little more patience or a little more presence. And so instead of going down that same superhighway of habit, we're shifting and we're going down a different pathway. And every single time that we do this, we're strengthening that pathway so that eventually that pathway becomes the habit. And habit number 10, the last one before some very special bonus clips, is concentrate with Dandapani. People talk about being present, being in the moment, being in the now. And you see all these cute little Instagram quotes floating around. Be in the moment, be in the now. No one tells you how the hell to do it, right? You can't be in the moment if you can't concentrate. The ability to be present stems from being able to be concentrated. And put your awareness on something or someone for a certain period of time. Exactly, yeah. So how can I be in the moment here with you if I can't concentrate? So everybody talks about the end product, which is be in the moment, be present, be mindful, mindfulness, right? I mean, sold like, mm -hmm. you know, bottled water everywhere. But they don't teach you concentration. You can't be mindful unless you concentrate. Mindfulness is a byproduct of concentration. In understanding the mind, the simple way I teach people this is there's two things you need to understand. You need to understand there's the mind and there's awareness. So let's define both of them. I define the mind as a vast space with many different areas within it. One area of the mind is anger, one area is jealousy, one area is happiness, food, sex, photography, so many different areas of the mind. Mm -hmm. And then you have awareness. I define awareness as a glowing ball of light. So imagine an orb or ball of light that can float around. So. Your mind doesn't move, but it's your awareness that travels to different areas of the mind. So you hear people say all the time, oh, I have a monkey mind, or my mind travels a lot, or my mind's all over the place. Technically, I believe, from my experience, that's false. The mind doesn't move, but it's awareness that's traveling within the mind. So your awareness can go to the happy area of the mind, it can go to the sad area of the mind, it can go to the scientific area of the mind. Your goal is to control your awareness, that ball of light, and determine where it goes in your mind. Hmm. And your ability to keep that awareness in one area of the mind for an extended period of time is your ability to concentrate. So if you're reflecting on something, you're meditating on something, it's your awareness, it's in one area of the mind, and you're holding it there long enough to actually gain knowledge from it. I know you talk about reading just now, right? Someone opens a book, is reading. The ability to keep the awareness on that page that long enough, light. the ball of light on that page, right, allows them to gain information from the book. But if they can't keep it there long enough, they don't gain anything, right? So understanding awareness in the mind is the precursor to learning how to concentrate. I would say the simplest thing you can do is practice doing one thing at a time, which is very difficult for people. So if you're speaking with someone, give that person your undivided attention. Keep your awareness on them. So imagine your awareness again as a ball of light. I'm speaking to Jim. If my awareness starts to drift away, I bring it back. It drifts away, I bring it back. So I use Jim as an opportunity to practice concentrating. So if you have a spouse or a partner or a loved one that you see every day or you speak to every day, then use that person as an opportunity to practice concentration. Every time you speak with your spouse, could be two hours throughout the day, give your spouse your undivided attention. Now you have two hours of practice and concentration. Now I've got a special bonus clip that I think you're gonna enjoy. But before that, it's time for the question of the day. I wanna know what was your single biggest takeaway from this video and your plan of action for the next week. When you watch a video and just get motivated, you have a 35% chance of actually following through. That's what the science says. And that is not good enough, Believe Nation. We need to do better when you actually get motivated and then create a specific plan of action for what you're gonna do this week, you have a 91% chance of following through. And when you publicly commit to somebody else, like leaving a comment below on this video, it jumps even higher. So I want that for you. I wanna know your single biggest takeaway from this video and your plan of action for the next week so I can celebrate with you. The most amazing thing in your life for most people in the normal state of consciousness, uh, and normal means somewhat or very insane. In the normal state of consciousness, the present moment is usually overlooked habitually, unconsciously. People have been conditioned to overlook 
the most important thing there ever is because your entire life consists of the present moment. There never has been anything else. Everything happened in the present moment and when you remember it, it's the present moment. And when you think about the future, which of course never arrives as the future, it can only arrive as the present moment. But people live as if the present moment were undesirable or an obstacle or they actively dislike it. And some people habitually live actively disliking the isness of the present moment. Usually when you talk about the now, then people, it's usually associated with, okay, the first thing that appears then in your awareness perhaps is your surroundings. And that's already a great step into the now. It's the first important step into the now to become aware of whatever surrounds you, the space that surrounds you, wherever you may be, and whatever takes place in that space. And you may notice when you become aware of those sense perceptions, because it's through sense perceptions that you become aware of whatever happens around you, that involves visual, auditory, and such, to some extent the other senses too. The main ones being visual and seeing and hearing. So as we enter the now, we become more aware of our surroundings. It's the first step into the now. And now, when you do that, and let's do that now, just not as not thinking I'm going to practice now, no, just become more aware of your surroundings. It's no practice, and it's not a doing, it's just it, an awareness arises of the, this room, the people in this room, the man sitting on the chair, talking, the lights, beautiful arrangement there, and that is the space of now. So. You, so what the word to use is you acknowledge what is and close to acknowledging, you go a little bit deeper, you appreciate what is. What before you probably overlooked completely. And that's already a wonderful thing and there are some people who are not yet ready to go any deeper than that, and that's fine. It's enough to just go two steps into the now. Well, let's, let's call it three. People like the idea of steps. <laughs> let's call it step one. You become more aware of your surroundings. Step two, <laughs> you acknowledge. Oh. And with the acknowledgement comes a sense of the goodness of the ways in which life manifests continuously around you. There is an aliveness in everything. Even in the middle of a city, you might say, oh, I prefer the forest or the beach or the mountains. But even in the middle of the city, whatever happens, all the movements in the middle of a city are manifestations of life. Life manifesting as human beings running around, as cars, as houses, buildings, and noise, and so on. And there's also something there that is fine. It's, your, it's an acknowledgement of life. And then comes an appreciation. Oh, you, you might see something that you before had not appreciated, the sky, for example. How many times are you aware of the sky? And say, oh, and it's beautiful. And even a cloudy sky, there's always this light filtering through the clouds. Now, you might notice when you become aware of the, what I call the surface of now, which are the sensory perceptions that reveal the world to you, already a shift in consciousness happens because now you're not thinking as much. You cannot be very much aware of sense perception and really be looking at the sky or at a tree or a flower or a street scene and be 
thinking a lot. You have to be really there as the presence. For example, now. So you simply acknowledge the totality of this room. And that's beautiful. And then you go a little deeper still. The next step takes you deeper. Then you can ask yourself, what else is there to the now apart from the things that arise in my sense perception? What else is there? Is there anything else? Is that what the now is? What appears in the now? No. It's what appears in the now, but it's not yet the now. So to become aware of the present moment, to become aware of sense perceptions is an important step, and some people are so out of touch with their surroundings, they are never where they are. They are in their th the stream of their thinking. As you become more aware of your sense perceptions, your alertness, and when I say alertness, don't let that be just a conceptual thing. Alertness needs to be something that you can only, you can only know what alert awareness is by experiencing alert awareness. You cannot understand conceptually what alert awareness is. And everybody here, I would say, can know, knows already and can verify in their own experience the difference between being absorbed in your, the inner, being identified with the voice in your head, which is habitual compulsive thinking, and being in a state of alert awareness. If you want seven more ways to be mindful and present, check out the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe, and I'll see you there. Being present is literally nothing more than the skill of having your thoughts be in this moment, not in the past, not in the future, but right here. Observe where you are. Bring your full senses 